what we aim to do is just to give the, um, the indigenous significance of the, the harbour itself to the, to the visitors, many visitors that come out to our country and, and from inland and mainland Australia to come and check out Sydney Harbour instead of just seeing it as a, forgive me, I'll say it, but seeing it as a, well, from a non indigenous point of view. This traditional name for this area is Wakan Magali. Wakan Magali meaning Crow Headland. It's where the British actually first colonised down at the end of the bay here. They first attempted to colonise at a place called Botany Bay, which is a neighbouring harbour from here. But Botany Bay, the land and the waters proved inhabitable. But when the landing party attempted to land, the Aboriginal people threw stones and spears at the landing party and they returned musket fire and they wounded one of the Aboriginal men and it was at that stage there and then that they realised that maybe something was uh, happening here. Okay folks, we are coming to a very popular photo site here. You'll find many a postcard with this image on it. If you have a camera, please take this opportunity to take this photo. Since the European <laughs> occupation until very recently, government policy relating to Aboriginal people has been designed and implemented by non-Aboriginal people and the common justification for most policies for Aborigines was that it was for their own good. But it's now clear that none of the policies have actually made the condition of Australia's Indigenous people any better than it was prior to the arrival. Redfern and uh, Redfern, the, the block, um, has been like the, the identity of the Aboriginal community for, um, well, it's an identity in Sydney which everyone knows. It's been a strong Aboriginal community for many years. Now, what it's become right now, if you look at a lot of the housing here, um, it's sort of become the opposite and, and not for our own fault in, in many ways, in many ways. At the moment, you look at these places and you look at them, they're a wreck, but to me, you know, they, they indicate all those things I talk about, dispossession, about people not having an understanding of where they fit in. Everywhere else is being developed and everyone's, there's, there's money injected into their, into their area. We're getting left behind. I reckon, you know, in a lot of ways, we are in a lucky country, but you still see so many bad things. There's an intervention in the Northern Territory. If you're on some sort of benefit out there and you're black, you're going to be affected by it. They'll quarantine your money. Um, if you're black and you're out there on a benefit and you maybe even went served in the war for this country, you still can't, you can't drink. You don't have a choice. In the dictionary, apartheid is when you're setting one set of rules up for one nationality or one race and, and the good set for the other. And for us, we ended up with the bad set of, again. It takes away our independence, it takes away our identity and it, it doesn't deal with any of our issues. They're trying to take assassinate all the men and all the respectable families that live here. This is bullshit. This is un-Australian. The rest of the world, you've got to take notice and see what these dickheads are doing to us. This is character assassinated for all 
decent Aboriginal families in Australia. There's no need for this. It is shocking what's going on here. This is apartheid and the false pretenses of protection of children and protection of everybody. This is oppressing Aboriginal people more than they've ever done in the history of this country other than shooting us. There. Well, that can go and they're going to stick it up their arm. It is good to have it taken down. We don't need it. Yeah, go and take them down. They shouldn't be up there. I lived with this family when I was a little kid like these ones here. Mm -hmm. And they're respectable people. Mm -hmm. yep. And I know them. I know the grandparents, I know the parents, and I know all the children. They're respectable people. You've got to talk to us at least. Not coming along putting this disgusting thing, that's only reinforcing uh, racism within, this, within the community of Alice Springs, which is getting worse. Right? I bought some spare sheets and pillowcases. Oh, don't worry about me and all the kids. I have kids here all the time, so I'm prepared with everything. Yeah, I've got lots of blankets, lots of sheets, lots of everything. We're right. Remember what we spoke about today? Yes. Yes, sir. Connie, Alayma, Davina, Cecilia, Thornton, Adrian, Junior, Tara. You're going to go, your little one. Hey, baby. you going to go. Yeah. Yeah. They go long way. And in the Northern Territory, authorities are keeping a close eye on the Catherine River at Catherine. The river is due to peak this evening, but it's not expected to threaten the township. The Catherine River catching area was a I've just put the kids on the bus to go on a camp out bush with the youth department of Tungajur Council. Every house here has got children and they all come to my house. Um, don't know why, I guess I'm just a fun loving auntie, I guess. If this government was really worried about Aboriginal people and their children, the new policies that was brought brought out last year with the intervention had got nothing to do with saving children and it's got nothing about education and employment, training, everything that we lack and other people have. You got drug and alcohol problems throughout Australia um, and you probably got a lot of child abuse that happens behind closed doors in other um, non-Aboriginal race, races. So, no. So you believe the law is racist? Yes. It, it is racist. It is racist and it's racist because it's, it's a new law for Aboriginal people, not anyone else. Police, they come around, they just do their random checks to see if like drinking and all that sort of things because we're not allowed to drink in our own yard no more. We're not even allowed to, straight after work, knock off work, we're not even allowed to have a beer even though we buy it from the shop. A white man, if he was to drink that in his yard, they'd just drive past, hey mate, good day mate, we're true blue Aussies, you got your stubbies on mate? Yep, yeah, no worries. Put a singer on the barbie. Yeah, no worries fellas, have another beer for me, you know? And yet, if, as soon as a, I'm having a fellas there having a beer, it's, oh, let's go over there, tip his beer out, he's not allowed to have a beer. Quarantine law? The quarantine law, it gives me the bloody shits. It pisses me off. I mean, I'm, I'm a Vietnam veteran. I've been to Vietnam twice. I've been, I've been, I've been to Malay and Borneo. I served with the uh, British forces in, uh, against uh, the Indonesian confrontation. I went there, fought there, 18 months. And I come back here, and you know what I said? I feel like I'm living, a, uh, living like a refugee in my own country. I can't do what I want to do. I can't even have a beer in my own yard. Why shouldn't I be able to drink inside my house? I know I'm not allowed to drink in my own house because my wife has a rule that I can't drink or smoke inside the house. So I carry out my social life in terms of drinking 
and smoking outside with my children and all my old relatives who come from bush. I can't even invite my white friends that I served in the army to come here and sit in my front yard because they're not allowed to. This is me, I'm, 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 I'm the one here, I'm, I'm the one who's got a bit of colour. You know, Aboriginal people served in every conflict that existed that Australia was involved with. What's happening tomorrow? Yeah. Well, really this old lawman here, this old lawman, yeah. is uh, getting young men to go away for ceremony, yeah. for ceremony. Following their own culture, their own law, yeah. eh? Yeah. They go and sit down for a few days, and then they go through ceremony, and then they become men, like that, uh, what the Jewish mob call them, bar mitzvah, eh? Yeah. You can go with him. He invited you, this old elder, boss man, to go and be part of his ceremony. Uh, no doubt there's, uh, there's an issue with alcoholism. We've been trying to tackle this alcohol problem for many years. You need to look at the predispositions of people, the barriers within their life. People don't pick up a can of beer or a, uh, a bottle of liquor uh, for the sake of it. There are problems in people's lives and if people can't uh, knock down a brick wall or go around a barrier then uh, alcohol seems a, the better step to take. The offences are very high in terms of fines. I believe at the end of the day they're going to have to build another prison uh, within the Northern Territory. There's two prisons uh, at the moment and they're going to have to build two more because uh, people are going to be fined. Low income earners are going to be fined. I'd say the prison population within the Northern Territory, uh, both prisons, you're looking at 90% uh, Aboriginal people. I finally bought a house in Alice Springs. <laughs> Where were you before? Uh, we were renting for 12 months after we came back to the Northern Territory. Yeah. So here we are. This is a... Um, picture of my grandmother, Hetty Perkins, and the, in the background is the bungalow or the old Alice Springs Telegraph Station. My grandmother was the cook and they looked after all the children who were forcibly removed from their families, the stolen generations. She's my father's mother and also the mother of uh, Charles Perkins, who is my uncle, uh, the late Charles Perkins, and probably one of Australia's best known black activists and uh, I'm sure it was from him that uh, we all learnt uh, how to have the fire in our belly and to stand up for our rights. What sort of things did Charles, Charles do? What was his? You know? Well, he was the first Aboriginal person in Australia to graduate from university and uh, he led the Freedom Rides in New South Wales in the 1960s and he just uh, always uh, fought for the rights of Aboriginal people in this country. Well, the Freedom Rides were uh, bus rides taken by students at the Sydney University uh, through outback New South Wales. And um, they, the students went to the towns to expose the extent of racism and uh, discrimination against Aboriginal people. So even in the 1960s, Aboriginal kids couldn't swim at the local swimming pools, couldn't go into a shop and try on a dress without being, you know, frowned upon and so on and so forth. I have experienced racism here in Australia all my life and I believe in taking action against racism and breaking down those barriers. I believe that, but not all Australians are racist. Not all Australians are racist. My wife is a white woman. She's not racist. But there are a majority, I'd say, of, Aboriginal, of, of white people in this country at the moment have a, a racist attitude towards us because they've been misinformed and by, the, and by the activities of the government. We can work, but when you go down to, to Alice Springs and have a look, this, the, society, the, the employment in those, um, in those shops and that will reflect society. You will not find one 
Aboriginal person working in the shops here in Alice Springs. And that shows the world what Alice Springs and Australia is like towards the Indigenous peoples. That's my, that's my daughter's dog, a little miniature fox terrier to keep the snakes away, eh? That's yeah, yeah. And that means sister. My wife Janine's great grandmother. Yeah. And that's, there, that's my great grandfather, Kuruton. Note how he's broken the kangaroo leg to, to balance it when he got to walk a long way. And that's my grandmother. Her name was Jinjiwara. She was one of four wives belonging to this old man. His name is Bill Little. Mm -hmm. And that's my mother's uncle, their brother and sister. That's a sister to that man there. And he was the grandfather, my mum's grandfather. You young people got dreadlocks. See them dreadlocks there? Them dreadlocks from ancient times, eh? I'm very proud of the history of my family. Up here, that's me as a young man. And that was our Mandela. His name was Charlie Perkins. Charlie was our leader. I'm proud to say that I was it. Charlie's Angel too. This is the time of year now that we go out and make young men in the ceremonies. The young men have to go through the initiations here this time of the year. Women also do, do their ceremonies, but men, we do our ceremonies this time of the year. It is who we are, it is our being, and we have a right as human beings to maintain our culture. What the intervention and the quarantining was attacking our cultural practices. They went and said really bad things, what we do to young people when they come to the, with their grandfathers and their uncles and their brothers. They say that they said really bad things. That's entrenching the racist white people of this land's belief on us. Yeah, we're going to camp here tonight in the creek bed. Soft sand, it's good for the back. It's a lot of flies, man. They, these, these flies are going to get even worse tomorrow. So. Yeah. the sermon we, these young fellas are going to go through soon, there was an article in the Australian newspaper saying that Aboriginal men are taking young boys out into the bush and um, molesting them while they're in the bush, which is not true. We can't do that here. In our, in our culture, if any man was to do that, well, it, it, it'll get a big, big trouble. And Aboriginal trouble, not white people's trouble. Mm -hmm. The only place will save them is jail. We grew up from the ground. We didn't grow up from a four bedroom house. This is where we grew up. This is where me and my, me and my grandfather, we were born in the creek. We wasn't born in a hospital. And we loved living in the creek. Yeah, tell him. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Lance, if you run, Jay, if you run, Jay, you want to put up and you're alive, you want to put up and you're alive, Lance, if you run, Jay, you want to put up and you're alive, you want to put up and you're alive, you want to put up and you're alive, you want to put up and you're alive. 
kangaroo cooks itself in its own blood. That's him. Give him a stroll. feels very good for me as a young person to, to learn that sort of culture of our old people before it uh, starts slowly uh, being lost. Australian, uh, Australians are coming here and colonise this country had no fucking culture. They've got a Ned Shelley culture. And, 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 and they've got cultures that were born in Australia from other countries. And we've always had our own culture, our own culture and language. That's why we cook the Zarapush Taka. We live in the desert, we like a meal. Identity and culture is our very being. For so long in Australia, governments and uh, white people in churches and so on have tried to tell us who we are and whether we're Aboriginal or not and, you know, whether our culture is pagan or, um, you know, unchristian or non-Christian. And uh, they tried for so long uh, to beat it out of us, but uh, we have decided that uh, our culture is more important and we will uh, look after our culture. And if we identify as Aboriginal people, we're accepted as Aboriginal people, and our community accepts us, then that's it. There's no question about who we are. Now we're going over to this small camp over here and uh, my father over here, um, he lives there and he's been living there since he's uh, born and he's uh, well into his uh, 60s. He's my dad's brother and uh, I don't call him uncle, I call him father and uh, that's just a form of respect. Morning. Morning. This is my dad, father, uh, Comet Fischl. Living inside, making just an air bright. Madder than the top. These sheets of iron are made by 44 gallon drums. Yeah. How many people live in here? Oh, a couple of people except back in the station. Do a lot of Aboriginal people live like yeah. this? Yeah. Some living outside that river there, big mob there again. So it's most of the Aboriginal people live like this. Yeah. Are you sure about that? Yeah. Is is this what they call it? Would they call this a town? This yeah. is a community, an it's Aboriginal a community. community. Yeah. This is an Aboriginal community. Yep. Yeah. It's living in ravage house. This is the kitchen. So there's no form of electricity here, no running water. There's one tap over there in the corner um, for everyone to use. And this is Australia. And this is Australia. I, I think, uh, particularly in the Northern Territory, 
uh, we we haven't uh, had the uh, support to to learn how to live or to have the opportunity to have uh, four brick walls, a roof over the head, and uh, make that smooth transition into how uh, normal Australians live now. Aboriginal people have been immensely marginalised from mainstream society uh, in, all, in every way you can think of. Uh, in education, they had, where they had schools at all, you had a curriculum specially designed for Aboriginal people up to the age of grade three, up to, uh, in, many, in many parts of Australia, up to even the 1960s. E equal education now. Uh, secondly, uh, in employment, it was very difficult for, people, for Aboriginal people to uh, get jobs because the reaction was, but they won't stay here, they won't hold their jobs down, they'll uh, won't turn up to work, they'll be drunk, all sorts of prejudices like that. Back in the 1800s, only the white person was allowed to buy alcohol and drink in the bar. These days, um, I'm allowed to buy alcohol and, and I drink in public places. And they say I'm not allowed to drink in public places. And the public place is really my home. And the coppers come here and hassle me and they say, go home. How can I go home when I'm home? Like um, like mother and father, uncle, brother. Because I started, I started, started drinking. And I will start learn, learning from them up and because I can't stop drinking no more. People, especially like Australian people say, ah, oh, yeah, you, Aboriginal people drink a lot. I mean, before you point a finger at somebody else, take a good look at yourself. I'm an art coordinator. I work at Art Centre at Unimo. You work at Art yeah, Centre? Yeah, like me. I travel, I travel overseas. I've been to America a couple of times and last year. And I, I see different when I go to America and I see black people. And they write, they call me sister. Like sister brother. And when I come back here, I see white, face, white people here. And last night, I went to the pub. They told us to go away. They were racist. They called the police and we got locked up last night. My people have been walking around in this great country, what you call Australia, before the laws that come from England. I'm not England. I'll never be England because I'm original, Aboriginal. You, they sing the song that every time they sing, they say, waltzing Matilda, waltzing. I'm not waltzing Matilda. I am. My songs, are different than England. That's why I can never be England. I think the issue with alcohol abuse and drug abuse uh, stems from a sense of helplessness and hopelessness. And what's the point if there's no sense of having uh, any choice about the future and the quality of life that our people live? Um, when they're con constantly denied access to full-time employment um, and educational outcomes are extremely poor, um, health outcomes are, you know, way below those of so-called third world countries 
uh, and housing is just deplorable. So, you know, you've got really fundamental basic needs that exist in our communities that have not been met by any government of any persuasion in this country. Why do a lot of Aboriginal people sit down on the side of the streets and stuff? Oh, they like it. They enjoy sitting in the street, meeting up with families and talking. Or maybe they need to update their information at the Centrelink office. This is Centrelink. Centrelink is a government agency that deals with social security. <coughs> From Aunt Nancy. Aggie, morning. Did you you just go into Centrelink? I just come out from Centrelink. Okay. Try to go home now. Yeah, you can jump in here if you like. You too. Right. Yep. Tongue and jira. You want tongue and jira? Oh, tongue and jira. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you do in Centrelink today? Oh, nothing to eat. So they will tell me. So your money has been quarantined? The government has set your money aside? Yeah. And what did they say to you? Did they tell you that your pension's cut in half? Yeah. And when I get food order. Okay, yeah. And the rent. Are you happy yeah. about your pension being quarantined, half of it? Yeah. You happy? Yeah, I'm happy. If you are on Social Security benefits, 50% of your, say, $400 is automatically quarantined to be spent at the community store. None of your money is allowed to be spent on gambling, alcohol or tobacco. So you're not allowed to buy a packet of cigarettes with your money. If you do, 100% of your income support can be quarantined. It is the most racist, reprehensible decision and law that has been made in Australia. And to make these laws, the Australian government had to suspend the operations of the Racial Discrimination Act in order to enact this racist legislation. And they did it. Okay, Aggie, you want to go to... F how much is it? Show me your voucher. $50. $50. Okay, you can... We're going to take Aggie to our shop. Our shop is what we set up years ago, so our tank campers have got somewhere to shop. Yeah. Imposing uh, a system like this on on a set of people, on, on us, um, is wrong, and we said it's wrong, and we don't think it's going to make any difference to the lives of Aboriginal people. Um, it must be developed by Aboriginal people if it's to work, and um, our system has worked well for years for us. How is it that you've got a lot of Aboriginal people that live on, live on the street, that are out on the streets? Oh, they are, but that's just the way we are. You know, you might see lots of Aboriginal people out in the street, and um, that's the way we are, you know, that's who we are. But we, is, it, you know, is it a drink related to our house? No, you can see lots of people in, who, um, you know, I'm a non-drinker, some of my kids are non-drinkers, but we like to sit and mix with families and other people in town. Um, and, you know, that's the way we want to do things. Morning. Morning. Um, did you want to go to Little Sisters? Yeah. Okay, then yeah, I can give you a list. Yeah. 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 You ready? What house number, little sisters, you live at? Number two or number three? Hey? Eh? All right. We're entering little sisters now. Is this your house? Okay. You got everything? Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Mm. 
Oh. There are some good camps and there are some camps that need a lot of work done on it. We've only got two places that don't have leases. You must have a lease to be able to qualify for government funding to get housing and infrastructure and uh, you know good living conditions there. People sleep at doors because there's no air condition, no electric now. Pretty hard with the tin sheds and all that and we sleep outside. That's where we sleep now. This uh, kitchen. This is your kitchen? Yeah, this is the kitchen. And this is a tin shed where we live in. 15 or 16 people live here. Oh yeah, they drink. I mean, we drink, and we got no good houses to live in, like brick houses and got a uh, thing, light, street lights. We got nothing to live with it, but uh, that's the way I look at it. Because we don't get no job around here too. We didn't worry about it much, so we just keep going, living in a tent shed. Australia wants to be seen as a progressive, uh, Western, modern, democratic, fair-go society. Except it doesn't want anybody to focus on, all oh, they're interested in Aboriginal people is Aboriginal art. You know, and Cathy Freeman or, you know, if she can win a gold medal for Australia, you know, that's, they only like the success stories. They don't like anything that appears to be tainting the so-called reputation of Australia. Welcome to Darwin, where the local time is 25 minutes past one. In our small um, showroom in here, we have um, the dot style art, which is investment art, where the dot style comes from the central desert areas of Australia. People buy it for investment because the artists become very famous and the price of their art goes up and up and up. Right, at the moment they're now just starting to implement where they get paid like a um, unemployment benefits each week. When they get that they just spend it on grog, they don't, keep, they don't buy their kids food. They don't buy nutritional foods for their kids, which is going to last two weeks until the next time they get money. They don't have the ability to think that far. So now what the government's starting to introduce is certain percentages of their money can only be spent in certain stores on the communities to buy food and clothing for their children and women. They don't understand the concept of money. It's like a hose with water coming out of it. And when it stops, they say, right, who turned the hose off? Why did it stop? They don't understand that. They're very primitive people. Here they are, a bunch of Aboriginal people by the Australian government's right, just give them money and that will keep them quiet, you know? There's a lot of communities that are dry and there's a lot of wet. A lot of the dry communities, all the people are moving into the city areas where they can get access to alcohol every day. It's not like you and I will come home from work and have a beer. They will get up in the morning and just drink all day, anything they can get. Two dollars, right, I'll get alcohol with it. And that's, it's just such a bad problem. And it's because it's a hot environment, you're always thirsty, and the territory has always been a male-orientated place where people just drink and drink and drink. They won't go out and fish and hunt anymore because they don't need to, because the government supplies them money to go and buy things. But those things that they're buying are not necessarily the best things for their nutritional health. Was there real issues of child abuse within these communities? Oh, in the communities, yeah, within the Aboriginal race, yeah. On a scale that we would never get to see. 
because it's out there in the in the bush in the communities isolated mainly only just one or two families living in a in a house no one ever gets to see or hear about it and half the time they're drunk anyway like i say they're one of the most primitive races on earth and they have not learned that they have not climbed the ladder and understood that and now that they're integrated with white people the white people are now saying, oh, well done, this is not acceptable in this day and age and in this society, it has to change. Well, I became involved in Aboriginal art because I used to sell hats at markets and Aboriginal people just started bringing their product to me every day and saying, do you want to buy this? And I started buying it and reselling it to tourists. And then I had a great interest in the sound of the didgeridoo and I bought one and then started playing them and then Aboriginal people would come to my shops and we would sit under the trees and they'd teach me traditional rhythms and I became totally involved in it. This didgeridoo that I'm going to play here is probably one of the best didgeridoos in the world but I have a motto. The best didgeridoo in the world, there's always one better and there's always one worse and I have that same motto with people. artist. My dear me. But this is traditional art. I do something different. But uh, my ancestors my ancestors paint all this. Mm. The art world has woken up and saw the magnificence in, in these paintings and truly value these at the right price. And eighty and a half thousand is just a, a normal price for a painting like these. The, the similar Symbols of circles and wavy lines change accordingly to the story. That could be, or be a spring, or it could be a dwelling, or that could be a river, or, or that could be uh, sand hills. So they have different meanings and symbols according to the painting or the story that's written for it. My parents uh, found it difficult to raise all their children, so the government fat saw uh, in a different way and said we weren't, my parents weren't capable. So we were taken from our, my parents and placed into an institution in Adelaide. I spent uh, several years there until I was fostered into a white family, a Christian family, uh, until I was about 18. Uh, but fortunately I won a scholarship uh, to go to art school. So it was my own drive and energy that made me. And maybe the isolation of being away from my people made me do it because I didn't want to uh, feel that I was incapable of doing anything. I designed the flag. I wanted to show our presence so I thought of the idea that a flag should show us visibly in the community when we march down the street. It was a flag for our identity of who we are how we see ourselves. And when you look at the colours, I chose carefully, and the colours red represents the red ochre. I used the colour yellow because it represents the sun, and I've used the colour black. And that was about our identity. Be proud of your colour, your, your culture, uh, who you are. I read Malcolm X's diaries. Any, anything that would express the will of the black man the positive energy that came out of the Black Power Movement uh, was a necessary factor for us to raise ourselves and be proud and be strong uh, of who we are. Uh, Australia espouses to be a country where fair go is, is their, their uh, catchphrase, but it's, it's not working. 
and it doesn't it doesn't overflow into the black community. So the intervention really is I intervention into the pride and integrity of the Aboriginal people. purchase all the art off the artists, they get what I'd consider a fair rate. You've got quite a few famous artists that have passed through. You've got um, David... Uh... David Gopala, yeah, comes in and does my painting. Been painting off and on um, through this shop, out the front, upstairs for about three years. I wouldn't say he's prolific, but he does some beautiful artworks. Too much cigarette and too much alcohol and, um, you know, and all that drugs and all that things, you know. Yeah. But um, 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 I wanted to, you know, slow down or stop or, um, you know, because it's been a long time. Yeah, you know? you get a it house. should be, it should be, I shouldn't touch the drug. I shouldn't touch a uh, uh, cigarette. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, I see you soon, David. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm here now. See ya. Yeah. I'll be here. All right. Ciao. I'm an actor and uh, I stayed with John Lennon's and Jimi Hendrix and um, uh, Jim Brown and um, uh, Hamad Ali's and uh, all these people when I was in Los Angeles and Hollywood and all these things, they all the famous people and I became a famous because I went, when I went to the Hollywood. All I do, I make films and then I come and then I pay tax and then I run out of money and then I have to go to Dole. And if I go to Dole, I still pay tax and there's no job. So I had to come back right back in here, sit down and do some painting. And the only way that I can earn the money, maybe $25, $30, $50, well, is uh, because that's the game is they playing here in Australia. You are the best you. Aborigines Thank you, yeah. movie star. Actor, yeah. And uh, that uh, yeah. everybody yeah. knows in, in, in you all. Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. 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 I'm about to order another drink. David, yeah. come here. Yeah. 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 How much oh. is a picture like? Three, four hundred dollars or something like that, you know? For the three pictures? Yeah, yeah. So you have to pay, but you have to pay for that. Oh, very expensive, very expensive, baby. Okay. All right. See you, see you. They asked me the three painting, so I'll do the three painting for them because I got no money. And I said, okay. It's not the right price, good price. Uh, some people, they, they, they rip me off all times. Even though I'm making a movie and a film, I still pay not to cheap, you know. The Aboriginals in Alice Springs are moving to South Australia get away from the uh, intervention laws so they can drink freely. But you guys are drinking freely. You drink here. Yeah, they drink, see, they drink there's, 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 I'm not, I don't want to be What's racist. the difference? They don't drink in bars. They don't see Aboriginal bars. So they drink in bars. What's the difference? The difference is, the difference is we're civilised. That's the difference. The ones that are drinkers, it's been reported a lot more that a lot more of them uh, into pedophilia and bashing their wives than than um, what drinkers. I disagree that, that you know there's more of one or the other. Do you know what I mean? We're only getting fed what the media tells us. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we can only go off that. There's no real statistic. It's just what the media tells us and what they want us to hear. Bloody great.
people are laid back, relaxed, um, everyone has a good time, a dance, it kicks ass better than anywhere else in Australia, mate, that's all I can say. What do you think then about the intervention of the quarantine laws? Quarantine laws? I don't know anything about it. You need, you need. <laughs> that's the problem about Australia. They don't know anything about it. They don't know anything about it. They've never heard of the intervention. I've been living in Perth for the last five years and I've only just moved up last week. It's, it, it's on the national news though. You know what happened? In June 2007, they decided that Aboriginal people were not able to look after themselves. So are you from the Northern Territory? I've been here 20 years. You've been from the NT for 20 years? 20 years, yeah. Okay, so have you been to the uh, remote locality? Yeah, that's where I work. I've been there 20 years. I'm, so I'm working out bush. So so just because of that. the colour of your skin, you should not be disadvantaged. No. And I'm yeah. sorry, but it was white people who came here 200 odd years ago and mm -hmm. said, you live by our fucking laws. Mm -hmm. Fuck your laws that mm -hmm. you've lived by for 40,000 years. Mm -hmm. And by the way, here's some grog. Mm -hmm. Get it into you. Do you want to know where grandmother is from? Yeah. Yeah. My grandmother is from Sweden. Drinking in moderation is good for you. Uh, I drink a fair bit. I'd have probably six pack a night, which I don't know what that classifies me. You might call me alcoholic, but I don't feel that way. I still go to work at seven o'clock in the morning. What annoys me is how uh, Aboriginals freeload in a, in a sense. They stand there, they, they get given taxpayers' money. They, uh, generally they spend it on alcohol, generally they spend it on alcohol, cigarettes or, or drugs. Why are you talking shit? <laughs> There's such a vast, vast difference. Like, white people drink to have fun. I think Aboriginals mostly drink to evade reality, so it's very different. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't compare them, man. That's why you have specific laws like that are for Aboriginal like, and Indigenous communities compared to like Caucasian and like civilized communities. Darwin's a small town. I can go out once every three months. I'll still catch up with the same people drinking every single weekend. Drinking is going to be part of Australian culture particularly part of Darwin culture. I mean, you look at the stats and it... What do you think about the intervention of quarantine laws? That's to prohibit um, Aboriginals from drinking? You know? I don't know enough about it to comment on it. All right, all right, look, we've, we've got to look at ourselves as a white culture and as an Indigenous culture and come to some sort of agreement. We're sick of it. We're, we're sick of Aboriginals claiming whatever the fuck they claim. We're sick of white people being racist and, and derogatory towards all Aboriginal people because, you know, We've got to move on. We're meant to be the multi multicultural society of the world and... Are you? Well, no. We're fucking proving ourselves not. is the largest Aboriginal community in the Northern Territory. If they're going to spend money anywhere, you'd think it would be here. But if you look outside the window, what you see is government underspending. You see overcrowded housing, 20, 25 people to a house. You see minimal investment in the development of enterprises that leads to employment. If you think about the abuse of children, there are two recognised factors that lead to that, and they are overcrowded housing and high levels of unemployment. A civilised government should start by addressing those two issues. There's much said in Australia about the massive amounts of money that are spent in Aboriginal communities. In fact, the reality is the massive amounts of money that need to be spent that aren't. That is the root cause of that problem. What's it like living here? Uh, 
to me when I come in. It's, it's not good, you know. I can't plan properly. To me, fighting, people having problem with food. The food? Mm. What do you mean people I keep food? running out of money to buy this. Everything going on. Now, why do people children are sick. Why do people run out of money? First they, yeah, they buy smoke and drink. It's a problem of this house. Government, government don't give us decent house. For, because there's lots of people staying in this house. How many people live in this house? More than 20. Many. Some sleep in the kitchen. Some sleep outside the tent. Use the tent. This is my kitchen outside. And that's uh, toilet and laundry and shower. On the floor they sleep. My husband and I, and also four children sleeping in this room. So you have six people sleeping? Yes. Managar is a very strong, vibrant and dynamic community. There is um, a strong connection to land, language and culture that many people work very hard to preserve. And of course, where you see the very worst problems in uh, Indigenous Australia, they are in places where connections with land, language and culture have broken down. A certain way to fail in the implementation of programs in Aboriginal Australia is to do things for and about Aboriginal people without talking to them. And that is what the former government, the Howard government, was guilty of in Australia. Many cynical um, commentators believe that the intervention was a politically motivated stunt for the former government to get a boost in the election polls, not based on any serious concern for the uh, children. Then why is not the new uh, Rudd government uh, rolled back the intervention? Why have they not reversed that policy? The Rudd government, when they were in opposition before the election, supported the intervention. And um, they probably have some difficulty in um, overturning policies that they supported quite publicly at that time. There's no question that there are many different points of view about the intervention, but Labor, uh, before the election, when we are in opposition, did support it because of the horrific levels of child abuse identified in so many communities in different parts of remote Northern Territory. We thought it was essential to act. Uh, we thought it was essential to make sure that the police uh, that didn't exist in these communities were brought in to provide the sort of safety and security that the rest of us expect in urban and regional Australia, to make sure that the controls on alcohol were implemented, the controls on access to pornographic material, to make sure that welfare payments were spent in the interests of children. So yes, we do support it because we have terrible levels of child abuse in these communities and it's essential that action is taken. For the past six months I've been working as a coordinator for the combined Aboriginal organisations here in the Northern Territory. That coalition came together in response to the Federal Government's announcement about the intervention here in the NT. We were extremely concerned that there seemed to be so many elements that were encompassed, if you like, in the, um, the total package of measures that were to be introduced here, one of which was about the compulsory acquisition of Aboriginal land 
we fail to understand um, why the seizure of Aboriginal land and assets um, would have anything to do with protection of children. Um, we also fail to understand why things such as uh, the removal of the permit system, that is the requirement that visitors to Aboriginal land must go to a land council or to a governing body to seek permission to enter Aboriginal land, why that needed to be revoked or taken away, given that many people have relied on the permits as a way of protecting access to country and controlling who visits and, and um, enters Aboriginal land. So there were various elements to the whole intervention that we found were somewhat in consistent with what might have been proposed if we were really serious about dealing with child protection issues. I think for many foreign visitors and overseas journalists and governments there is an absolute um, bewilderment about what the hell goes on here in Australia. Many people I know personally, for example, see Australia as a very wealthy first world nation, very sophisticated country in lots of ways, and yet cannot understand why there is this level of socio-economic disadvantage and impoverishment of Aboriginal people for the most basic of things. It begs the question, what is it about Australia that we can't come to grips with this? We're actually talking about, at best, maybe half a million people. This is not tens of millions of people um, that we would have to deal with in a country that was impoverished or suffering from the ravages of AIDS. This is a wealthy first world country. We can do it. We have the resources. We have the capacity. What we've been absolutely lacking has been the political will and the commitment to see this through. We don't see that this intervention is at all about addressing, addressing the problem of child abuse, but you know, is about controlling um, Aboriginal lives and land. It needs to actually be campaigned against and makes a clear call for people to actually challenge it. We don't have to put up with any more of these crappy policies that turn up all the time that affect our people, it's oppressive policies. We have to deal with leadership here for our people. It's time that us all, we got to stand together, not only the people in the cities, out in the bush, down the ground, grassroots. You know, we put in all this work to try and get there and to show publicly, to not just to the government itself, but to the whole uh, of Australia, that we're not going to sit still anymore. It's about sorry day. It's it's a start. It's still, it's a start, you know. I mean, at least uh, the government is showing some interest towards Aboriginal issues here, which was never happened before. Twenty-two of us, including three children, travelled down from Alice Springs over three thousand kilometres to get here, um, and it took us two and a half days and two nights sleep on the road. I think it's worth it. Um, we've got a lot of support from the rest of the nation and we're all meeting inside now. <laughs> I next would like to invite to the podium a very special guest, um, the Ambassador from Venezuela. would like to say a few words about Indigenous peoples and rights and I would like to welcome him to the podium now to, to address this meeting. Thank you, please. It's not just here in Australia that we're organised or that Indigenous people are organising the struggle. Yo deseo que todo los planteamientos de ustedes tengan un feliz término. Um, I wish you a very successful and happy outcome with all the determinations of this meeting. Se ha abierto un debate en Australia sobre la importancia de las luchas indígenas. You are opening a very important debate about the uh, 
that is indigenous issues within Australia. In the Northern Territory, they have created the COVID apartheid. Call a spade a spade. And that's what they've done. The major objective of this alliance is to promote the voice of Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples at the national level for the purpose of protecting our collective rights. We're making history. We're, we're, we're fighting yet another government policy and uh, we're back in the political arena uh, trying to get the best outcomes for our mob, the Aboriginal people. This is my first time in Canberra uh, where there is an actual protest taking place and I reckon it's great. We're sick and tired of people in Armani suits coming out after a free lunch and drinking all our imported wine and telling us that they're sorry when it's a token gesture. Now, when we talk about the land grabbing, and a lot of people touched on the minerals underneath the earth, but when you look at the town camps within the, uh, within the townships, they're prime real estate. And that's what they're after, they're after our land. They, when you look at town camps when they first developed, they were on the outskirts and the fringes of the, town, of the, town, of the towns. Now, as the town swell up, it grows. We're now in eyesight, of tourists, of anyone living in that town. If we don't stop it now, it will flow on. We need to make policies for ourselves. We need Aboriginal control over Aboriginal affairs and that's why we're all here together to stop this intervention. We're going to meet the um, PM of New Zealand, Murray Party. Honey, how to wear it. Yep. Kia ora. Kia ora. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Did you come? Hey, mate. Hello. So, thanks for coming. Where's your army? I haven't done anything. Yeah. <laughs> I just got off the plane. Yeah. 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 The rights of Indigenous people and the struggles of Indigenous peoples are the same the world over. That's why I'm here, to show our support for what they've got going on over here. This flag belongs to us. This is representing the Northern Territory, all around. Oh, okay. Aboriginal is all around. Okay. And also we came here for visit uh, Balaman House for sorry. Right there. <coughs> going to be standing like this with his hands, fingers crossed behind his back, and he's going to say, Sorry. And all his parliamentary followers are going to have their ears crossed, their fingers crossed too. Like this, say, Geez, I hope they're followed by that. Because there's a lot of shit. We all know it. There's a lot Out of, of shit. Out that, all the Australian public's going to say, Oh, we said sorry to him. What are they whinging about now? <coughs> so, still got to keep the pressure up in, in not just one way, but many ways.
We apologise, especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. For the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for their families left behind, we say sorry. We today take this first step by acknowledging the past and laying claim to a future that embraces all Australians. A future where this parliament resolves that the injustices of the past must never, never happen again. A future where we harness the determination of all Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to close the gap that lies between us and life expectancy, educational achievement and economic opportunity. There comes a time in the history of nations when their peoples must become fully reconciled to their past if they have to go forward with confidence to embrace their future. Between 1910 and 1970, between 10 and 30 percent of Indigenous children were forcibly taken from their mothers and fathers. That as a result, up to 50,000 children were forcibly taken from their families. But this was the product of the deliberate, calculated policies of the state as reflected in the explicit powers given to them under statute. One of the most notorious examples of this approach was from the Northern Territory Protector of Natives, who stated, and I quote, generally by the fifth and invariably by the sixth generation, all native characteristics of the Australian Aborigine are eradicated. The problem of our half-castes, to quote the Protector, will quickly be eliminated by the complete disappearance of the black race and the swift submergence of their progeny to the stolen generations, I say the following. As Prime Minister of Australia, I am sorry. On behalf of the government, on behalf of the parliament, and I offer you this apology without qualification. I think it's long overdue. I think it's very necessary for us to move forward and to understand the pain and hurt and the loss that these people have suffered. Well, you can't really redo what already happened, but it's a start. I guess for my mother, who's been dead over 30 years, I guess for her, she's at peace. She, that's all she would have wanted to hear what was happening today. But I guess... Uh, there's a lot more to be done, and apology is only the beginning. It is a tremendous step that has been taken through the apology. It's not the complete answer to everything, but it's a huge burden that's been lifted. The fact that it was made, made nationally and on the, in the parliament, um, I think it, uh, it sends clearly the message that Australia has operated on racist policies and has sought to, to destroy the Aboriginal society. It failed to do that. And as a consequence, we have all these other problems that we now are going to have to deal with. The intervention is really uh, now a, a despairing act of governments that have uh, no longer uh, been prepared to sit down and, and work through with Indigenous leaders strategies and, and processes that will help to uh, 
respond to the crises that we all know that are in our communities. Alcohol is a problem for all Australians. Drug taking is a problem for all Australians. Child abuse is a problem for all Australians. It's not just in the Indigenous communities. So we've got to find solutions that are about the nation. This is where I sleep, under the Milky Way, under five billion stars. I don't try and pay money to sleep in a five-star hotel. They don't agree in the way we like to live. And somehow we don't agree in the way they want us to live. I like to feel the earth with my feet because I was born with no shoes and I'm sure the modern man wasn't born with shoes as well. So I'm, yeah, like some people say, I'm the first and the last. I am the spirit of Australia.